My name is Dave Verardo. Tim Colleen was scheduled to moderate this session and uh, he sends his regrets and me. So I work at the National Science Foundation. I'm the, the uh, head of the atmospheric, atmosphere section in the Division of at, uh, Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences. This afternoon's topic, hazards is, natural hazards is important and timely, as we all know. You know, my view on natural hazards is we can't approach them as simply, simply sort of statistical abstractions. They are anything but. These, it's hard to understand them objectively because uh, hazards harm people, they d damage property, and, and they, they uh, change communities, sometimes forever. So it is difficult. A, di a difficult subject, but an important one. And let me at least identify our panelists before we actually get started. To my immediate left is Susan Cutter, and then uh, Rob Leland, uh, Louis Gritzel, and Melissa Stultz. And our first speaker today is uh, Susan. So let me tell you a little bit about Susan. Susan is the um, he is Carolina Distinguished Professor of Geog Geography and the Director of the Hazards Research Lab at the University of South Carolina. And Susan's going to talk to us uh, about the geographic patterns of natural disaster losses across the U.S. and the need for establishing uh, some baseline so that we can uh, measure efforts aimed at resilience and adaptation. Please welcome Susan. Good afternoon. It's nice to be here. Um, I've changed my title a little bit to um, talk about the unsustainable trend in natural hazard losses uh, with some evidence on the geographic variability uh, in those trends. So the question that I want to pose is, in the United States, are natural disaster losses increasing? And if so, by how much and where? And the answer to the question is, we don't really know. And the reason we don't really know is because the nation does not have any systematic accounting of hazard events or losses by specific hazard source or by location. And this is an, an interesting statement because over the last decade plus, there have been calls for such a systematic accounting uh, starting way back in 1999 with a comprehensive study done by Dennis Maletti uh, called Disasters by Design. The question is, why don't we have such a systematic accounting? And, and there are some reasons, and I've, I've listed these. Um, first, the event data is collected by many different mission agencies in, in the country. We also have data that are collected by private sector insurers, and oftentimes there's no articulation or sharing among the agencies, or in the case of the insurers, oftentimes it's proprietary um, data. We also do not have any consistent measurement standard for losses, and as we heard from the last session, um, there are differences between insured losses and uninsured losses, between direct versus indirect losses, and in some instances, agencies monitor dollars, and in other instances, they monitor deaths. We also find that there are per some parameters are measured um, while others are not. Some losses simply aren't, aren't large enough to qualify as disasters, so they won't get into FEMA um, disaster declaration databases. And I think the bottom line is that simply there's a lack of political and administrative will to collect, to archive, and to maintain the systematic loss data that's necessary to inform public policies. Just as an example of the, the dollars versus the deaths, um, the National Climatic Data Center puts out uh, a product, the Billion Dollar Weather Disasters, which is uh, the map you see here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it does not always include deaths in those billion dollar disasters, and one of the more obvious missing ones is the Chicago heat wave, which is the largest death producing singular event that has happened in this country. Um, and also, if you look around the world, uh, heat is a, a major cause of hazard mortality. So where are we in 2012? 
Well, we're not very far. We do have a, an existing uh, database called SHIELDIS, which stands for the Spatial Hazard Event and Losses Database for the United States. Um, but as you'll see shortly, um, it's okay, but there are some issues with it. Uh, this is a county level online searchable database um, that covers the period 1960 through 2011. It is called from existing uh, federal databases that are accessible. And so it includes hazard event types that not only are, are related to meteorological events that one can get from uh, NCDC, but also geophysical events that you can get from USGS. It includes only direct losses um, estimated by these federal data sources. And right now, it has about 694,000 records. And these records are searchable online through shieldus.org. And you can search by date, by geography, by hazard, um, by um, presidential disaster declaration, by major disaster event. Um, Shieldus does not include the territories. And as you'll see shortly, it is a conservative estimate of the historic losses. In other words, it is the floor of the losses. We don't know at the moment how much more the losses are, but we know that this is the, the floor for those losses. Just to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of analytics that one can undertake, through this database, uh, you can look at natural hazard fatalities. And if you look at the trend line, because we've got now 50 years worth of data, we see that it's relatively flat in terms of, of the deaths. There are some spikes uh, to that, and those spikes are uh, in the form of, of heat waves, in particular uh, early on in the 70s, the Rapid City um, flash flood, and then, of course, uh, Hurricane Katrina. And if you look at the, the cause, which is the pie diagram, um, most of those uh, hazard fatalities are related to severe weather. If we look at the pattern of economic losses, uh, we can see that there is uh, an upward trend. Um, that upward trend is, is, um, includes Hurricane Katrina, which to date uh, continues to be the most costly uh, natural disaster, um, but there were some other spikes um, that I've listed here, Mount St. Helens, Loma Prieta, and Hugo, which happened in the same year, along with Hurricane Aniki in Hawaii, um, and the Northridge earthquake, and you can see from the pie chart that there's a more even distribution of the causal agents for um, these economic losses. There's been a lot of controversy in the literature about losses increasing and, and the increase is related to inflation, uh, it's related to, to population increases, it's related to increases in wealth or exposure. The bottom line is no matter how you normalize or standardize the data, direct losses are increasing. And this is something that we uh, as a nation need to examine. So what we have is what we like to call the disaster loss escalator and the disaster impact escalator. If we look at the average annual losses in the United States in terms of 2009 dollars in the 1960s it was only uh, 4.7. Uh, by the 2000s uh, 23.6 billion and projections increasing up to 30 billion. If you take this as an average annual dollar figure per capita, every person in the country put in $24.80 in 1960 uh, in terms of, of the loss, but by the 2000s it was up to $80.10. And so the, the question is, how do we reverse the loss escalator? Well, one of the things that is important to understand is you have these, these broad national patterns, but some places are more affected than others. And the uh, effect 
is a function of the, the geographic variability and the decadal variability. Um, so in looking at the, the pattern, the geographic pattern of losses, of direct hazard losses using this conservative database, we see in terms of total dollars over this period, this 50-year period or so, Louisiana comes out as number one, largely related to Hurricane Katrina. Um, you see California, Florida, Texas, and, and Mississippi rounding out the top five. If you look at the total losses per capita, which is one way of, of, of normalizing your data, you see that Louisiana drops down to number two, and it's Alaska that comes out. And this is reflective of the 1964 earthquake in Alaska, which is included in our database, which is what ranks and helps that uh, come up. The same thing is true of the annualized impact. And the annualized impact is the per capita uh, dollar losses uh, divided by the, the um, per capita average income. So it really is a measure of um, the differential impact in, the, in these places because a million dollar loss is not the same everywhere. And a million dollar loss uh, to Los Angeles County is a very different, has a very different impact uh, than a million dollar loss in a rural Calhoun County, South Carolina. And so this notion of an annualized impact uh, takes that into consideration. The other thing are the last two columns. And, and what we see in the data is that there are um, some places that have a singular large event that over this 50-year period really shows the, the, the pattern of loss. There are other places that have continual repetitive events that over time add up to a relatively large loss and a relatively large impact. And it's the second type of place that really uh, informs us about the resilience of those places because they have um, a major flood event and they're just coming back and three years later or four years later they have another major event. And so this notion of the, the repetitive losses, these large losses, uh, really does affect the long-term resilience and you can see that in those annual average per capita losses. In the 90s, for example, it's North Dakota, Iowa, North Carolina, places that are repeatedly hit um, in the first two with flooding. And in North Carolina's case, it's flooding as well as um, hurricanes. Louisiana, it's hurricanes. In California, it's largely wildfires. And we see similar sorts of, of patterns happening in 2000, 2009. Notice Florida there, that, that was the decade in which um, 2004, which the four consecutive hurricanes hit Florida in, in a very short period of time, which significantly influenced its capacity um, to respond. If we also look at the post-disaster spending, we're seeing that um, the black line there represents the, the shieldist, very conservative estimate on direct losses, um, and the blue is the NFIP program. Nathan is a surrogate for insured losses and then the presidential disaster declarations. Um, I point this out because we have a disconnect between the spending that we're doing on disasters and the conservative estimate of losses. And this brings into question why we need a better estimate of losses because they may be grossly underestimating and, and the expenditures may in fact be a, a better measure of what's going on. So what can we conclude from this exploratory uh, information about um, the disaster loss data and the geographic uh, variability in it? Well, we know that hazard losses are outpacing population growth and the increases in wealth. Um, that these patterns uh, reflect a few singularly large events, such as Katrina, such as the Alaskan earthquake, or even Mount St. Helens. We know, and, and this for me is a key finding, that the relative impact of hazard losses is increasing for the nation. The increasing trend suggests 
on the order of $7 billion annually we can expect, and that there's this enormous gap between the direct losses and the post-disaster spending using the conservative database Shieldis. Um, and whether or not this, this reflects the inherent um, biases in the Shieldis data set is, is probably true, but it also may reflect um, that communities are not resilient and it just takes a minor disaster event or hazard event where they immediately go and seek federal funding rather than absorbing those losses um, by themselves. So what needs to be done to get us to a place where these disaster losses might in fact be sustainable? Well, the first thing we need is better accounting of the hazard and disaster losses. So we're not using a, a relatively conservative database, but one that is a bit more accurate. And to echo the calls of these previous reports from the National Research Council and others, uh, I think it's high time that we have and we implement a, nat a national hazard loss information system. Uh, this system needs to be a systematic accounting of hazard and disaster losses. It needs to be accessible to everyone. It needs to be uh, geo-referenced, and it needs to have as many natural hazards uh, as we can account for. The value of this, I think, is, is very clear. It will provide the scientific basis for a policy particularly hazard mitigation. How do we know the effectiveness of hazard mitigation if we don't know where we started? Has hazard mitigation influenced loss reduction? We don't know because we don't know where we began. Has the national flood insurance reduced losses? We don't know. We don't know where we began. We do not have a baseline in this country. We do not have a benchmark against which we can measure the effectiveness of any kind of loss reduction program. The idea of a better systematic accounting means that it will improve our understanding of the causes of many of these disaster events. Is it because we're having stronger storms and we can anticipate under conditions of climate change that these losses are actually going to increase um, because many of these are related to climate sensitive hazard? Is it a function of weaker mitigation? Right now, we don't know because we do not have that, that baseline. And it provides us a mechanism for monitoring long-term resilience at all levels. Because it's a database that's geo-referenced down to the county level, we may see resilience and, and changes in these per capita measures in some places and not others, which means that we can more effectively target uh, resilience programs. We can more effectively target mitigation programs. It's very clear in examining these data that a one-size-fits-all policy is not going to work. And we need to recognize that, but we need to have the evidentiary basis by which we can reallocate resources to affect the greatest amount of change and enhance the resilience of the nation's communities, its states, and therefore the nation as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was great. Good, uh, good way to uh, start us off. Our next speaker is uh, Robert Leland. He's a director of climate, the Climate Security Program at Sandia National Labs, and Rob's going to address the issues of uh, address economic, environmental, and security impacts in the Southwest with some um, specific examples uh, from New Mexico. Please welcome Rob. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a bit today about climate change impacts through water shortages across the U.S., zooming into the Southwest region and New Mexico as examples. And you could think of uh, climate change as one of the very important precursors to the natural hazards that are the focus of this panel. Uh, so it may be that the uh, unexplained escalation that Susan talked about is in fact uh, in part due to climate change. That's a, a matter of debate and, um, and I'll speak to that a little bit. So um, my main message is going to be that 
the policy and the technology communities really have a shared responsibility here. We need a much deeper and broader collaboration between the two communities in order to address the very serious challenges that climate change uh, is going to pose to human society. And I want to illustrate that with a couple of examples. So how many of you know about the growing freshwater shortage around the world? Okay. Well-informed audience, thank you. So in most of the long-term uh, security studies, the, this uh, comes out as one of the top few issues uh, in terms of human impact. And Admiral Titley spoke to this briefly yesterday in one of the panels where he said climate change is really about water, about changes in salinity, about drought, about distribution of al and allocation of water, et cetera. And so that's really the, the vector of human impact that we focused on in the work I'm going to describe to you here. It turns out that it really is pretty acute. So the World Health Organization defines water usage for humans by various different gradations. They use units of meters cubed per person per year. And if that metric is above 1,700, things are healthy. That's for personal use, for industrial use, etc. If it's below 500, they define that to be a crisis. Now the worldwide average is about 560. And you can see that through that middle third of the geography of the planet um, where most people live, there's uh, quite a lot of red there. Red is the high stress area where things are at that margin, at the 500 meter or less um, uh, meters cubed per person per year. I want to zoom in here on the, the western part of the United States. And it's even an issue for us. Of course, we're a wealthy society. We have very advanced infrastructure. We have a large ability to adapt to water shortage. But in the western part of the United States, we're withdrawing water at a much greater rate than it's being resupplied to the watersheds. And you can see even in that, so the, the red there is where it's 100% of supply withdrawal up to 500%, so one to five times the rate at which we can sustain. And you can see that on the eastern uh, half of the map, in fact, there's a lot of red uh, at the local level. So this is a serious issue in many localities around the country. And this is all I irrespective of climate change. So this is usage today. Climate change is very likely going to make that worse. On the left-hand side, you can see a projection uh, going of temperature changes from 2070 to uh, 2100 uh, relative to 1950 to 1980. And on the right you can see the projected pattern of precipitation changes as a result of that. And, and basically the message is those white and red areas are going to go into a more severe drought. So what's shown here is a projection of precipitation uh, as a function of I think it's 26 different models run multiple times. So 53 different runs from the IPCC suite and what this projects is uh, obviously a lot of variation. <laughs> okay, so the models clearly don't agree. They're basically anywhere from 20 to 45 inches per year. That's the vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is 2010 through 2050. And so I, this, for me, creates empathy for the policymaker. <laughs> uh, it's really kind of hard to say, well, you know, what should I do with that? It just looks like spaghetti. Um, but it turns out that we can make some sense of that. And we were asked uh, to, to do so by Secretary of Energy Chu, who asked us to see, well, could you quantify the economic impact of climate change over the long term on the U.S.? And so we did that using uh, a model that I'm going to describe in three parts at a high level. The first is some set of climate projections around temperature and precipitation. We used IPCC because those are a good reference point commonly available. But one thing I want to emphasize is that none of what I'm going to say really depends essentially on that. We could use a different suite of model projections if you prefer. What we're really trying to do here is demonstrate a methodology to go from that very noisy set of projections to something that's actionable for the policy community. Okay, and then the next thing we do is we put that into a hydrology model that we developed at the lab which basically allows us to project the water availability, so supply minus usage, um, taking into consideration agriculture, industry, et cetera, all factors. 
And then with that water availability output, we put that into an economic model, which is a commonly used model, the REMI model, the regional economic model that states typically use to model the uh, economic future. And we're able to calculate economic consequences. And of course then there's behavior ad adaptation, which is in that economic model, and that feeds back into the water availability loop. So you can see that little dashed line showing the feedback in the end. And we do this all from a risk perspective. So we look at the possible consequences and the likelihood of them, and we, using some um, sophisticated mathematics, combine them and integrate them in order to, to arrive at the projections I'm going to describe to you. So back to that spaghetti plot of water of precipitation. By using the technique I described, we're able to, to combine those different model projections weighted by the uncertainty in the models and come up with a cumulative distribution. So that's the, the, the project as a result of that whole ensemble of event, events, the projected probability of the precipitation being a certain value. That's that blue stair-steppy line you see there when you integrate all those curves weighted properly. And then the red line going through them is a best fit to that distribution. And the dashed lines are confidence intervals, 95% and 5% confidence intervals. So using that distribution, which actually looks pretty nice, uh, we can then go and progress through that, the other stages of that model that I mentioned. Uh, there is one other thing you need to do in order to kind of make sense of that. So this is a cumulative distribution. I don't know if you can read it, but um, about a third of the way across the horizontal axis is 32 inches per year and that corresponds to 50 percent probability on the vertical scale for example. We actually need to kind of turn that around for the analysis we want to do. We need to define something called an exceedance probability which is just one minus this. So that is the probability that a given level of precipitation will be exceeded. Now, that's what you want to do from a risk perspective. And when you do that, then we can put that into the economic model and we can get some very nice curves from that. The upper left chart shows the uh, projected risk to GDP as a function of those precipitation inputs. So you can see in the far left, it's about 100% probable that that effect will exceed $700 billion. Kind of in the middle is about one trillion dollars and then at the far end there's some small probability that it might exceed two and a half billion dollars. And you can do the same thing for projecting job impacts. Uh, those range from about three million to fifteen million over the 40-year period from 2010 to 2050. And you can do something similar for exports, for example. You can go across the economic dimensions in the model. Okay, and then what we did is we plotted that county by county across the United States and then aggregated at the state level and did a kind of a stoplight chart. The red here is 0.2% to 1% loss in GDP is considered a significant negative impact. So something that's interesting here is you look at California for example, um, they actually lose precipitation but they come out ahead and the reason for that is that the surrounding states lose precipitation as well to a greater degree and so there's economic opportunity in California so the population migrates over 40 years to California and brings wealth with it. So there's that level of sort of sophistication in second and third order effects built into the model. And Then I wanted to zoom in a little further and look at New Mexico there and here you can drill down and say for example kind of in the middle of the chart retail industry. There's a 1% probability that the impact will exceed 5.2 billion dollars and a 50% probability that it'll exceed 2.5 billion. So now you get to see that you can get enough resolution with enough kind of sense of the probability of these consequences perhaps to start making some choices. Maybe one economic sector looks a lot more, a mitigation in one sector looks a lot more significant than a mitigation in another would for example. And of course we can tally that up by GDP and we can do a similar thing for employment. Of course behind all those numbers are some very real stories just kind of connecting back to the emotional theme that, uh, that Dave mentioned and the basic focus of our session here today. Uh, in, uh, we've had about a 10 year drought, severe drought in the southwest now. Uh, it's very severe in New Mexico as well and that increases the likelihood of forest fires. 
Um, and in 2011, we had the Los Conscious fighter, Fire, which was, burned about 150,000 acres, actually the largest forest fire in the history of New Mexico. We have a couple hundred forest fires in the state every year. So the largest is a pretty significant statement. That photograph on the left there is actually a photograph from space satellite imagery. So you can get a sense of the scale of that fire. And then subsequent to that, we had a couple of very heavy rains that, because the ground cover had been removed, caused flash floods. And in one case, uh, they came down and wiped out uh, a very precious local business. It's an orchard where they make they grow the best apples that I've ever had, and you can only get them there, and they're special, and everybody in the state knows about it. And they were wiped off the map by this. So I wanted to go on and talk about a second example briefly, and that's thermoelectric power generation, which is also being impacted by drought. You can see here on the map uh, red dots that indicate coal-fired electricity plants, and the brown regions are regions of drought, cross-hatched, more severe drought. And, uh, and, in, and in particular, an increasing drought trend. And um, there's an important relationship, it turns out, between the two, uh, which is that thermoelectric power generation is the big water user economically in the country. Uh, I was kind of startled by this plot, and maybe you will be too. Uh, that's, uh, there's this really important synergy between how we generate electricity and water usage for cooling. And so um, there's an obvious possible tension there. And we can resolve that tension uh, somewhat quantitatively by modeling. This is similar to the talk in the last session by Marianne Walk, where she was talking about modeling capability. And uh, here, basically, the important thing is to consider all the different constituencies' needs and how they interact in a dynamic and quantitative way. And the underlying agenda here is that by bringing the constituencies together, you can create transparency and trust between them and make solutions possible that might not have been previously. This is actually work done by Argonne. We at Sandia do uh, some very similar work. We've deployed that locally to model the Rio Grande, nationally to water the power, uh, model the power problem I just talked about. Even internationally, we recently did some work modeling the watersheds across Iraq, and we were able to bring the constituents together and help them formulate a, a plan that was counterintuitive to them, but uh, ended up being very sensible. They had been thinking they would build dams. They've been on the brink of war twice in the last several decades with Syria and Turkey over the prospect of building dams. The analysis showed that, in fact, they would do much better by simply insulating their aqueducts, uh, lining them so that they didn't lose as much water. Um, so that's the kind of power of these models. In the case uh, that, that we're talking about here, using it domestically for that tension between energy and water, you can see on the right, uh, the blue and white, well, the blue is where it's cheapest to build a new power plant. Um, on the left, you can see the orange and red where it's most water constrained, and so where it would have the most negative impact on water stress. And so if you were just looking at the right-hand diagram, you'd say, well, we should build power plants in Texas and New Mexico, let's say. Um, but if you look at the left, you'd say that would be a bad idea because it's going to exacerbate the water stress, which is going to have broad impact um, on the natural hazard issue. Uh, so this is we can start to frame these problems more quantitatively for the decision makers. So in summary, I wanted to just share with you these thoughts. Uh, climate change is posing a very serious challenge to human society. Um, I think that they will manifest, these challenges will manifest in environmental and economic and uh, social dimensions that will have high impact on both national prosperity and security. Um, there are technically deep approaches that can mitigate those impacts and inform policy, but if used in isolation, they'll have little impact and will fail. We really need to have a deeper and broader dialogue between the two communities, the technical community and the policy community, in order to leverage those approaches. Thank you. Our next speaker this afternoon is, uh, is Louis Gritzo, who is the Vice President and Manager of Research at FM Global. And uh, Lou is going to uh, talk this afternoon about the economic impacts and trends 
adaptation and mitigation options and, and case studies along with risk in risk communication. Please welcome Lou. Thank you much, Dave, very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I can personally attest to the water issue because I moved to Massachusetts six years ago from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and experienced water rationing in my basement flooding the same week. So uh, th these, these things do happen. Um, I'm going to also break a, a fundamental rule of mine uh, right off the beginning here, which is I'm going to talk a little bit about us before I get to talking about what I think you really want to hear from us, which is what we think about science and science policy going forward. Um, first of all, I, let, me, let me tell you who we are not, who FM Global is not. We are not MF Global. So the order of the first two letters really makes a big difference. We have nothing associated with MF Global. It's a completely different company. I, I don't know what their MF stands for, but FM for us stands for Factory Mutual. So that's, that's our background. Um, also, we're a primary insurer, and there's been some discussion at this meeting already from reinsurers, and Frank was uh, involved in the earlier uh, panel from the Reinsurance uh, Association. Uh, but we're a very different kind of primary insurer. Um, we've been around for 177 years now, and we really are a specialty company focusing on commercial and industrial property. So when I talk about our focus in commercial and industrial property, it really means three things. Protecting property, protecting its contents, protecting business interruption, and protecting its supply chain. So those are the three things that make a big difference for businesses, and then those businesses obviously have cascading effects on local economies. Second point is that we believe that the majority of loss is preventable through research and engineering, not that the majority of loss is predictable through actuarial tables. So we're really an engineering company that writes insurance as opposed to an insurance company that uses actuarial charts. And that really distinguishes us from the rest of the primary insurance sector. And the last part is we're owned by our clients. We're still mutually owned. So really everything we do is for the benefit of our clients. When we have positive years, we return those benefits to them in terms of a membership credit. We make risk selection knowing that all of our clients are being put at risk by poor decisions that we may make. And so that really frames everything for our business model. So to give you a better feel for more about the company, the numbers, uh, one three of uh, the Fortune 1000 comprise our clients. Uh, they do business worldwide, so we're in 130 different countries. 72% of our clients are multinational corporations. So if you take a look at our board of directors, you'll see companies like PepsiCo, Caterpillar, Disney, uh, multinational corporations that have operations all over the world. And obviously that makes a big difference in terms of the U.S. economy and the U.S. well-being. The company and our business, how we implement it, we have 5,000 employees. About 1,800 of those are engineers. Uh, about 1,300 of those are working field engineers in our engineering office. Um, let me give you our number of actuaries. Um, that's the number of actuaries we have on staff. It doesn't mean that we don't use loss statistics. It means that we use loss data in conjunction with technical data to make risk decisions. And we do about 100,000 client uh, facility risk assessments per year. So the way we implement our business models, our field engineers go into every one of our clients' facilities over a certain threshold of property value. They do a risk assessment. It goes in a risk score. We provide that to our clients, and that's our basis for underwriting is based on a technical risk assessment of those clients' location. So here's the research that we do. Um, most of the time you think about insurance research, you think about statistical and economic research. Obviously, we do that as well. But we do a great deal of physical research. We have the world's largest fully functioning fire laboratory, uh, natural hazards laboratories, and this complex is located in western Rhode Island. Um, I think we're the largest property holder in Rhode Island. We have 1,600 acres out there. So if you're ever interested in seeing some, uh, some interesting things in terms of how property loss prevention research is done for the commercial sector, uh, get a hold of me and I'd love to invite you out there. Uh, several of the AGU staff came out within the last month. I think they found it useful and interesting. We, uh, we not only perform research and product certification testing here, but we also have an important education mission in terms of what real loss scenarios look like for our clients, stakeholders, and code, code officials. We supplement that full-scale testing with both fire and all the natural hazards, with uh, professional staff that are just outside of Boston, um, material science laboratories, pretty much anything that breaks at one of our clients' facilities comes back here. And so we've called this group kind of the CSI Boston 
Um, it, it's a, it, a little different, but they use a lot of the same tools in terms of scanning electron microscopes and X-ray fluorescence devices to do forensic analysis of what fails. And then with the affordability of scientific computing, uh, we do a lot of hazard analysis, both for fire explosions and all the natural hazards with scientific computing at this facility as well. So that's a little bit about who we are, who our clients are. We obviously work throughout the industry. If you were here yesterday, you saw Carl Hetty from Munich Re, uh, one of our important reinsurance partners. We're also a partner in the Institute for Business and, and Home Safety. Uh, one of the things that we've worked on with them is the, uh, uh, the uh, roof-mounted equipment. You can see the scenario on the left where otherwise perfectly undamaged building um, finds its equipment to be a significant factor in its loss. Probably the most important thing for this audience is not that we're an insurance company or that we do research and, and that we try and reduce losses, but that we have an engineering network and a set of engineering standards that we use for commercial industrial clients worldwide. We develop these standards, we make them publicly available online for anybody to use, and it's important to this audience for two reasons. One is that oftentimes these form the, the basis for consensus standards through NFPA, the International Code Committees, for loss prevention. Second is that we can implement changes to these standards literally in days or hours, rather than waiting for years for consensus standards to go through the review process. So these standards then are based on our lost history and our research and our engineering knowledge and how we're going to protect our clients in the Fortune 1000 from losses around the world. And they're applied consistently around the world through these 19 major uh, engineering offices and 39 major field offices around the world. So this gives us a great way to implement results of research, which as a researcher is obviously very rewarding. But in terms of when you look at a business and how you're going to have impact on policy, and commercial industrial property holders, this is key. Not only are what you do important, it's the products that you use. So we have a separate member of the FM Global Group that's a, a certification for fee service. So we actually test products related to loss prevention and make sure that they perform as they should. So sometimes this is compared to underwriters laboratory. Um, we have a little different model. This is not a revenue generator in itself, although obviously it functions in the black. Uh, this is an, a part of our organization that makes sure that when our engineers go out to a client and give them risk recommendation or risk reduction guidance, that they have products to choose from, from this approval guide, that have been tested and we know are going to perform as advertised. Because there's nothing more frustrating than having a Fortune 100 company invest millions of dollars of capital expense in a risk reduction improvement to their facilities and have the products that they use be inferior. So we keep this, and you can actually find some products that are available for homeowners. I realize the anchor bolts I bought from Home Depot the other day were, <clears throat> were approved at one of our research facilities as well. So that's who we are. Let me give you some, some thought uh, exercise here about what we see as the current landscape. And there's really three big pictures going on here at once. The first is we see accelerating globalization around the world for businesses. Second is we see increasing vulnerability of those businesses specifically to natural hazards. And third, we see a compounding effect of broadening economic pressure throughout the world. And the way these come together has been mentioned uh, at several of the sessions before. If we start with accelerating globalization, we know that the GDP composition is going from what we now consider to be the developed nations to the emerging, emerging nations. And given that most of the losses now are occurring in the developed nations for natural hazards, we're going to certainly see an increase in those, and we're going to see a shift as that development happens in emerging nations that don't have the kind of quality of construction and codes and standards that we have here. Now, why does that matter to us? Well, um, we're in a global economy, so events that happen in emerging economies have negative economic impact on the United States and our citizens. We know that we have increasing vulnerability. There's lots of different ways of counting losses, which has already been discussed. Uh, if we use Swiss Re's numbers, uh, at least as a common basis, in the last 15 years, insured losses have gone from 10 billion to 100 billion. Uh, business risk insurance uh, just released the data for commercial industrial property risk at 116 billion last year. So clearly the trend is increasing. What we've done is some studies with the Wharton School and others looking at what companies do, and we find that 96% of companies have operations exposed to natural disasters. If we pull their CFOs and find out how seriously they take it, 
only 20% of those CFOs are seriously concerned about the impact of natural disasters to their bottom line. So there's no doubt that the vulnerability is increasing largely due to the perception of risk with corporations around the world. We know part of that's due to aging, aging infrastructure in the U.S., the decertification of levees, as well as power grid vulnerability to transformers that are no longer or that were built largely in the 70s that are not as robust to space weather, a couple topics that have already been mentioned. So these three factors, globalization, increasing vulnerability, and broadening economic pressure, really put us in a position where we've got a brittle system of interdependencies that's functioning around the world and cascading events then have a greater impact than they ever would before. So what can we do? And I've got just a couple quick examples. Well, our job is managing natural catastrophe loss. If we look at the risk scores that we provide for our clients and we take the top quartile and compare them to the bottom quartile, we see a factor of 28 difference in risk between those top and bottom quartiles. And in terms of severity of loss, we see a difference in average loss of over $3 million per event. If we take a look at a specific event like Hurricane Katrina, we had 470 locations exposed to Hurricane Katrina. About half of them had followed our standards and implemented uh, all improved locations. The other half had yet to complete our standards, and we see a difference in loss of $2.30 per $100 in total property value, all the way down to $0.37 cents per total insured value of property, per $100 of TIV, rather. A reduction in 84% due to risk mitigation measures that, on average, cost less than $10,000 per location to implement. So we know it works. We know it can be done. We also recently know that even things like flood can be managed with simple cost-effective flood barriers and flood walls protecting a facility during significant events. So what's the role of science policy in this whole picture? Let me give you some thoughts. First of all, the big issues as we see it is really understanding the hazards. Christchurch was a surprise. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in this area. I will have to say the U.S. government is by far the best. We get better access to better quality data with no fee in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world, and that helps U.S. businesses. I wish it were this good other places, but we still can improve. Practical incentives. We've talked about risk-based pricing. I could tell you a little bit about how that works. It works to a limited degree, but there are some very practical barriers there in terms of balancing direct and indirect benefits, as well as balancing both short and long-term benefits. One of the best things that works for risk reduction is when a, a company decides that it's in their best interest for the market volatility of their stock, for the protection of their people, for the protection of their business, for the protection of their market share, to reduce their vulnerability to natural hazards. That's what works the best. And lastly, risk communication. This is a shopping mall that uh, flooded to the 100-year level twice in a week. Most commercial industrial risk managers believe that a 100-year flood only happens once every 100 years. I would ask you to change the way we refer to these events to 1% events. We send the wrong message when we talk about 100-year hazards and automatically people go to a place that's really not accurate nor really behooves them in terms of looking at motivation for risk improvement. So what would I ask you to do? Well, first of all, we can change globalization, we can change the vulnerability, and we can to some degree change the long-term broadening economic pressure. So please work with industry, us and our clients, to do three things. First of all, we need federal policies for joint hazard research. We need to improve our knowledge of the hazards. We find the best risk reductions in places where everybody agrees there's a hazard. Second, state, federal, and local policies need to invest to in adopt and enforce codes and standards and to make inventory, uh, infrastructure improvements. This was discussed yesterday. I can't emphasize the importance of this enough. And lastly, we should all embrace and practice understandable communication about risk. It's got to be in a way that we can talk around the dinner table about it, and the picture is very clear that, yeah, that 100-year event is not going to happen 98 or 99 years from now. It has a 1% chance of happening this year. Thank you very much. Our final speaker for the afternoon is Melissa Stultz, who is a, a science research fellow in adaptation at the University of Michigan. And Melissa is going to uh, speak on the topic of ground adap 
uh, ground adaptation efforts that are taking place at, lo at the local level across the U.S. and, and the barriers and opportunities uh, to encourage more successful local adaptation. Please welcome Melissa. Thank you very much. Well, seriously, thank you for staying for the last formal session of the last day of the conference. When they told me they were going to put me last, I knew I had a hard job. So I'm going to lighten things up a bit. I'm going to tell a lot of stories, anecdotes about what's happening at the local level. And I'm going to change, obviously, our temporal and spatial scale by going down to the local level and then thinking both about short term, but also really about long term trends and changes in weather and climate. This is also based very heavily on work that I did before going to the University of Michigan uh, at ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability. So that's where these stories mostly come from. So let's first take a look at the landscape, what we know. <clears throat> You've heard this, you know this, but let's just highlight again. We know that today's climate and weather is different than yesterday's, and it's also going to be different than tomorrow's. Things are changing. We know that we're already vulnerable, as we've seen, to weather and climate impacts, and those vulnerabilities are going to be enhanced. We also know the actions we take today directly influence our adaptive capacity, our ability to respond uh, in a resilient fashion or not to changes and impacts that we're going to experience. Climate change is a threat multiplier. It's not the only thing that we're concerned about, but it certainly is likely to make the things that we care about change, sometimes in positive ways, a lot of times in more negative constructs. We know that proactive planning is more cost effective than reactive planning. And uncertainty will always exist, but uncertainty does not mean we don't know that it's happening. We're uncertain about the amount that's going to happen and our response to what's going to happen in terms of a changing climate. We know our climate is changing, so that's not the certainty we're dealing with. We also, this is sort of a point that I always try to emphasize, particularly at the local level, climate, and I'm thinking climate right now, so climate adaptation and climate mitigation are not mutually exclusive at the local level. I would argue they really shouldn't be mutually exclusive at any point. When we think about issues, we really need to think about mainstreaming these concerns. So it's just a, a main point that you're going to experience often at the local level. So let's take a look at the local context through pictures. Many of you, I think, know that we're having a little bit of a hard time in terms of the economy. Uh, local governments have laid off a drastic number of staff. Most of them are operating at reduced capacity, a capacity that's completely unsustainable. They have staff working on multiple different issues. So we've got the reality of finances. We've got the reality of overworked staff. We have mandates that come down from state and federal agencies with no funding and no support to implement. So we've got people doing literally 10 different jobs at one time, and oftentimes without the training to do all the work that they need to do. We've had an increase in natural hazards, so this is another reality. And of course, hazards happen at the local level. They happen at a place. We have a huge disconnect between our information providers and our information users and the policy makers, and that's a reality every day. And then, of course, we still have uncertainty. Even despite that, I think that's an important contextual piece, we still are seeing a lot of action. And I think you need to kind of think about those different constraints local governments are being faced with when you look at what it is that they're doing. And that makes it even more impressive, I would argue. So the way I'm going to go through this, I'm going to give some overarching themes, and then I'm going to drill down to examples of where communities are doing this work. So the first theme that we're seeing really in bridging sort of this hazard mitigation, climate adaptation divide is integrative or mainstreaming planning, where we're thinking about how do we take existing priorities or existing issues and build climate or hazard mitigation into that. An example, Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, just got climate into climate adaptation considerations or resilience building into their sustainability plan that was just passed. It was actually passed just a few months ago. Uh, so now they have sort of an official stance. They're checking policy, gauging progress in terms of building resilience of their local community towards weather and climate impacts. Lewis, Delaware was one of the first communities to formally integrate hazard mitigation and climate adaptation through their FEMA approved plan. So they went through a year and a half stakeholder intensive process, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting place. It's also not a place we would traditionally think of. Uh, so very, and it's very beautiful, by the way, if no one's ever been. Um, and then some other examples here across the country from Chula Vista to Keene, which was the first municipality to integrate climate into their comprehensive plan. Uh, this is a huge effort and is really quite impressive if anyone's interested in local governance. I'd highly recommend you take a look at that. 
So let's, let's drill a little bit deeper into this idea of integrating hazard mitigation and climate adaptation. So in Lewis, Delaware, uh, this came about through work with Delaware Sea Grant, the state, the regional FEMA office, uh, and in this case, ICLEI was one of the partners, as well as naturally, the city was heavily involved. And so what we did is we organized a series of workshops where we brought together the information providers who had the sea level rise scenarios, and we were focused on sea level rise in this particular case. Uh, they had the sea level rise scenarios. We, the state was also going through a sea level rise planning process. We brought together the residents and the businesses, and then of course, the city council. And they met for four different workshops and sat together. And it was very much a stakeholder two-way dialogue actually more of a three-way dialogue with participants speaking to each other about issues of concern, activities they'd like to see happening, what's the vision for where Lewis was gonna go in terms of being a resilient place. And it ended with a city approved, unanimously approved in a relatively conservative community plan that FEMA, because regional FEMA was involved, FEMA actually adopted and is now sort of holding up and saying, this is an example of the way you bridge that temporal scale. You plan for hazards, as we know, it, maybe we don't know, but traditionally hazard mitigation work focuses on historic hazards. That's what we predicate our decisions on. Well, that doesn't work anymore because history is no longer a guide to the future. So what we have is literally thousands of communities across the country taking the FEMA guidance, looking at historical hazards, and using that to plan their future development. That's a system that's broken. That won't work. So Lewis' example was saying, okay, we know that's not going to work. Let's take historical data, but marry that with the projections of future climate, even despite uncertainty, and let's plan for what we think the future will be in a sort of flexible, robust way so that we can change it. That is novel. And this, to me, is one of the silver bullets that we have to invest in if we are going to ensure that places can build their resilience towards climate change, regardless of the amount of change that we have. Another trend that we're seeing is work across geopolitical boundaries. As we know, hazards don't stop at our city line or even our state line. So we're starting to see municipalities work across what were traditional barriers or, or sort of, uh, we'll just, we'll go with barriers that existed for lots of lots of reasons. Uh, some examples here, in San Diego Bay, there was an effort um, and I'll talk about this one in a second, that brought together five municipalities, the Navy, the port, and the state, as well as some nonprofits, including NOAA, the Tijuana Estuary there, to really look at sea level rise and how they could all plan discreetly as well as, as a region coherently to build their resilience. The Inner Mountain West has a very interesting project looking at water issues, but they're very different municipalities. They're not the traditional stakeholders we think about. They range from Tucson and Flagstaff to Boulder and Denver, very, very large geographical area, but they recognize in this case information sharing is pivotal and they also need the political cover that comes by working collectively as a group as opposed to going out on their own. The Southeast Florida Climate Compact is a very interesting initiative that's underway with the four counties uh, in coastal Florida. Uh, there'll be some, there's a lot of documentation of this work. This is really critical because traditionally there have been governance barriers between the counties. So a lot of effort has really been breaking down those boundaries so that they could move forward collectively. They're focused on adaptation and mitigation as a region. Uh, very interesting if anyone's interested in more detail, happy to share that. There's a lot of great documentation. And then a few other examples we're pretty familiar with. So in terms of the San Diego, again, this was a multi-municipality effort. It was initiated by Chula Vista in San, the city of San Diego, recognizing both of them were concerned about climate change, but as they went through a process of mapping their vulnerabilities, they realized the vast majority of their vulnerabilities were things they couldn't control. The transportation system, they only have limited control over certain types of roads, ecosystems that are pivotal for the area, the economy. So what they recognized is they needed to collaborate across non-traditional boundaries in order to build regional resilience. So we brought together the municipalities in the Bay, as well, again, as the port, the Navy, the state, and some of the nonprofits, formed a steering committee and went through an intensive stakeholder engagement process again, where we did a lot of GIS mapping, we overlaid a 100-year flooding scenario with the 500-year plus sea level rise, and basically demonstrated all of the assets that were of concern that were likely to be inundated through those different scenarios. They actually set up their own 
uh, threshold, their own tolerance levels based on their specific information. So again, it was a nice marriage of the information providers with the information users and the decision makers so that what you finally came at was something everyone agreed on and everyone was in, involved in creating that information. Knowledge was co-produced. So the final effort led to a plan that is now actually being implemented, which if you work with local governments or you work with any government, you know that plans being implemented uh, is something to celebrate. Importantly, I think we, we have to recognize that most communities are, are extremely vulnerable today to impacts. So a lot of what's happening is they're dealing with today's impacts, but also trying to figure out how those impacts may change in the future so that their decision making can be more robust uh, and, and deal with the uncertainty inherent in how extreme climate may be in the future. These are just some examples of existing priorities. This could be heat preparedness, uh, whether that's green roofs or urban forestry. We've got a picture on the bottom of Mayor Bloomberg in New York working on white roofs. Green infrastructure certainly is becoming very, very important at the local level. Uh, water conservation. These are things that happen because they're important and they need to happen now. But climate change could be a threat multiplier to these things if it's not integrated into the work that we're doing today. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I want to leave time for questions, but this is just an example. I think you'll have access to the slides. Philadelphia is doing a lot of really great work, working um, in particular with the nonprofit community as well as with the National Weather Service to really make sure that information is getting out to stakeholders in useful and usable formats. We're working on the National Climate Assessment right now, and I'm sure many of you are too, and that is by far the number one message that we are going to put out there. It is no longer acceptable to produce information if it is not, if, if stakeholders aren't involved in some format in that. I would argue they need to be involved through the entire life cycle of information production, but we also cannot put information out if it is not in useful and usable formats particularly when dealing with an issue like hazards or climate change. It's too critical, and I'd argue there's a moral imperative for us to do this work. So closing, two final slides I want to sort of end with. One are, we need to be realistic about the barriers that exist. And this is not an exhaustive list, but at a high level, we know we have imperfect information. You're going to constantly hear a call for downscaling. We hear it all the time. So we've got temporal and spatial issues. We have certainly a lack of access to data. Local governments are bombarded with information. If you go to the Southeast Florida example, they're working with something like 15 different agencies that are giving them different data, and often that data is in conflict. What do you do? I mean, we have to streamline access to information if we're expecting stakeholders to use it. We also have a, a sense of, no, there's a lack of knowledge about what to do. So you, you tell us we're vulnerable to, to these things, and, and that's a very scary image, but, but what do I do? How do I increase my resilience? How do I monitor my success? How do I know if this even worked? So there's this dearth of information about what we do and how we gauge our success. Um, a few other things. Communication is going to be critically important for us going forward at all scales and at all levels. Visualization appears to be working quite well. Of course, you've got to tailor that to what's appropriate for the context. But again, we the other sort of, I, I'll call it the elephant in the room that we have is that I don't think our governance and institutional structures are set up to really allow us to build resilience. We have very siloed departments that do this work at all levels of governance, not just at the local level. We've got to find creative ways of bridging those different divides. Because if we don't, what we'll end up doing is doing a really great plan and implementing a really great strategy for public works, but it directly conflicts with our ecosystem management goals because we never brought them into the dialogue. So we've got to find ways of really bridging those different divides. And lastly, some takeaways here. I think the most important is that local governments are planning and are taking action. This was just a, a high-level snippet of what's happening. We have over 1,100 municipalities who have signed the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. We have tens of thousands doing hazard mitigation planning. Local governments are acting in this area, and they're acting in very different ways for very different reasons, but there's still action, and we need to applaud that and encourage it where we can. You in this room matter significantly for a number of reasons. You're providing the information local governments need to make deci decisions. You're a trusted source for that information, and that's something that never should be devalued. You can be a strategic partner. You probably live in these communities. You're close to these communities, so you can be a stakeholder in these efforts. And you can help us figure out how we break down traditional barriers that exist with your creativity, with your energy, and with your different administrations and offices that you support.
And I would just say going forward as we think about efforts, walk out of this great conference, please consider engaging with stakeholders in all faces of the research that you're doing. Whether that's design, project design, the actual research itself, the implementation or the evaluation, bring stakeholders into that process. It's gonna greatly enhance the usability of the work that you're doing, which is probably very important. Uh, tailor to the local context whenever, the, whenever you can, if you really want it to be used. Support local efforts, and last, please help us figure out innovative ways to break down these barriers, because I would argue this issue is way too important for us not to at least start engaging on. Thank you. Thank you.